good morning, everyone. This is Alicia McGrath, um, and I'm going to be the chatter for today. So um, just making sure that you all can hear me. Um, and if you can, if you can uh, chat in, especially those uh, that just came in just the, in the last probably about five minutes or so. All right. Thank you all. All right. We've got some other people that are um, piping, so good deal. Good to, to, okay, thank you, Melissa. She can still hear me. Good. You never know with the internet if it, it could change in a heartbeat, so. Um, that is wonderful. Um, like I said, I'm going to be your uh, chat support for today. Um, the main person you're going to hear from is um, David Kirkpatrick. So um, I'm going to confess all my transgressions um, right now. If this, any of the slides look a little wonky, that is my fault, not David's. Um, he made a, a very wonderful presentation, and um, I probably kind of messed it up. So. Any mistakes you see is totally my fault and not his, so uh, just be kind to me. Okay, Julia, thank you, will do. Um, but um, I'll turn it over to him just a couple seconds, and uh, most of y'all are familiar with Adobe Connect, but um, just in case you're not, um, like I said, y'all are going to listen to David present, and then when we are done today, um, you just click the X in the upper right-hand corner, and that will get you all out of there. Um, I will send out an email probably in the next couple days with a certificate of attendance and a survey for you all to um, fill out. So appreciate all of y'all being here this morning. And without further ado, we will let David Kirkpatrick um, take it away. And I'm going to let um, him uh, introduce himself because um, he knows himself the best. Unfortunately. But, yeah, he's a <laughs> really wonderful guy. Wonderful person to work with here at KDLA, so y'all are going to enjoy this webinar. So I'll let David take it away. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. I hope you can still hear me as well. I have two things going against me this morning. First of all, this is the first webinar I've ever done. And the second thing is I am battling Kentucky allergies. I've lived here all my life, and I still can't get used to the spring pollen. So I hope everybody can hear me. And uh, a third confession I'll make is that <laughs> probably most of the wonkiness in the presentation is my fault, not Alicia's, but we, <laughs> but we will go with that anyway. So good morning. Thank you all for being here. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you on this collection. Uh, just a brief introduction of myself. As Alicia said, my name is David Kirkpatrick, and I work in the archives research room here at KDLA. And I think I have probably one of the best jobs in the agency because I get to acquaint people with the collections that we have. I help serve as the public access point to all the records here. And I've been here for eight years and still discover small collections that I was not aware of. So I appreciate the opportunity to do that again today. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know about the WPA, I think most of us probably have a basic knowledge. But for anyone who's unfamiliar with it, I'm going to give you a little bit of background and then we'll, we will get into it. The WPA, or the Works Progress Administration, was created in 1935 by an executive order of President Roosevelt. America's in the grips of the Great Depression. We're struggling to get out of that. And like so many of the other, so many other New Deal programs, the purpose of this was to get folks back to work. Uh, but not just to any job, but one that matched their education and their experience. One word you'll see over and over in the description is uh, this is employment with integrity. We're trying to get people back to work in the areas they're most familiar with and the areas where they've built their careers. So the end result is an eight-year program that employs eight and a half million people. And this is a federal program, so let me go ahead and issue a disclaimer real quick before we go any further. It's not the kind of thing you're going to see at KDLA, or in the state archives anyways, very often. We house primarily state and county records, so marriages, wills, deeds, tax records, court cases, those kinds of things. We don't often get collections like this because they don't fit our mandate. So, again, we are primarily a holder of state and county records, but the Historical Society of downtown tends to get the narratives, the oral histories, things like that. So that's one of the things that makes this collection so unique. Of our collection, also, one of the reasons it's primarily unknown is we have about 83 rolls of film, about 310 boxes of records. So it sounds like a whole lot, but when you consider we actually have 69,000 rolls of microfilm in the research room alone and 100,000 cubic feet 
of paper documents. It's not a large collection. We're going to start by going over the kinds of records found in this collection, and then we're going to break off and discuss uh, topically how they're relevant uh, to researchers and librarians. So if you have any questions any time, do feel free to jump in. And Alicia, if I don't see them, flag me down, interrupt me or whatever. Okay. When I get on a roll, I don't always notice things. So there are a lot of small records types and collections within the WPA collection that we have here. But the four main kinds of records we're going to have uh, are records on the projects completed by the WPA, the writer's project, which we're going to discuss in two halves, the personal stories in the America Eats project, which is one of the favorites of the staff, uh, inventories of local archives, and our photographs collection. So starting with that, we're going to go ahead and get into the most obvious first. I hope everybody can see these slides. I'll go ahead and toss this out also as far as a further confession of my wonkiness with the presentation. Some of these records, as I mentioned, are copied from microfilm and then scanned and then tossed into PowerPoint and then converted into a program that Adobe likes. <laughs> so the images are not quite as poor when you're here in person, but uh, if you can't read anything or there's a question, do let me know. Um, as we stated initially, the WPA's job is to get people back to work. Many of these jobs are construction type uh, projects, landscaping, building of schools, the grading of roads, things of that nature. So uh, that's going to be the bulk of the building project information we see here. This is an application for a project. People submitted what they thought needed to be done, and then the WPA would decide on whether to approve it or not. Um, these are pretty self-explanatory on the surface, but they're extremely valuable for local history researchers. Um, anybody who's worked reference at a public library can tell you that they're constant attempts to update local collections on public history and we see that a lot in the research room as well. The great thing about this collection is that we get such detailed descriptions of what's going on in the county. For example, this is a an application from Washington County and I'll pick counties at random, three or four counties as we go throughout. But basically what the county is asking for here is there's a piece of undeveloped property five miles north of the county seat of Springfield that they think should be a public park. It's the boyhood home of Thomas Lincoln, who father of President Abraham Lincoln, and is thought to be the site uh, where Abraham Lincoln's grandfather uh, was actually killed when he was trying to settle the area. So sensing the historical significance of this, the local officials felt this would be a great place for a park. They submitted this application. It was reviewed by the WPA, including the estimated cost, which you see at the bottom there, and it was approved. And today, if you're traveling through Washington County, you will see Lincoln Homestead State Park. You can see from the sign beneath the welcome sign that the uh, replica of the uh, Lincoln household was recreated as suggested. They've added some other things. Uh, in the meantime, a golf course and a gift shop. But this is a piece of county history that's not going to be readily available elsewhere. So anybody who's looking to see uh, how local flavor, uh, local landmarks develop in the counties, this is a great piece of information and a great tool that you can use. It wouldn't even be a bad thing to have copied and in vertical files in a, uh, in a research room or Kentucky room. Another example here, and again the same disclaimer about the legibility of this record on the last slide also goes for this one, but uh, this is a more detailed description of the leveling of a road in the same county. Uh, we get a description of where the road begins and ends. We get a description of the kind of work done, the drainage ditches and things like that put in. We even get a description of how much it costs for this project to be financed down to the price for a keg of nails or basically a box of nails. So again, very important uh, collection for folks doing local histories, people doing social histories, not only of the WPA, but of labor during this period. That's a growing field, and we get lots of questions uh, of that nature here. So I'm sure local reference librarians do as well. Now, the project forms are not the only kind of information we're going to see here. We also have correspondence. Uh, we're coming up on the 100th anniversary of World War II. There's a growing interest not only in the 1940s, but the 1930s, uh, President uh, FDR's tenure. And these are extremely valuable for researchers who are looking into the kinds of programs that were implemented in the South. We see anything from Western Union telegrams to uh, written correspondence to statistical information. 
it seems fairly cut and dry on the surface, but a lot of this is broken down in ways that you're not going to find uh, in a documentary or in a public history, including number of people employed in various states and regions. So this is the statistical information, but it gets a little more colorful later on. In addition uh, to things that are handwritten, we're also going to have some personal research that was done by these uh, workers and members of WPA staff who are trying to ascertain which areas had projects that were the most pressing. And the kind of information they leave behind uh, is not only useful for people studying this period, but for people studying Kentucky history in general. So I just want to show you a few of the maps that were left over as a result. We see kind of what we would expect, federal programs from the 30s, but we're also going to see population trends from 1900 to 1930, increases and decreases in various counties. We're going to see uh, population decreases due to illness and uh, number of deaths, information like that. This is valuable because we had a researcher in um, not long ago who was doing research for the CDC, and he was concerned about the influenza epidemic and how it affected Kentucky, which areas were affected the most. This kind of information is extremely valuable for that kind of research. The literacy, we are constantly getting uh, people who are updating their county histories on education. This is valuable from that point of view. And even the number of students who attend various schools in the state and where they're from. You will not have a problem finding attendance records uh, for universities in various places. But where those students are from is often only found on the application of the student, and obviously those are not public record. So this kind of information is valuable not only for people who are studying Kentucky during the period, but also for people who are doing studies of education and other topical subjects. Not every bit of the statistical information in the collection relates to the WPA. We're going to get a variety of uh, resources from the period, so anything from Army recruiting stations uh, to information on other programs such as Civilian Conservation Corps. So uh, this is valuable for World War II researchers. We have a gentleman coming in right now to do research on the State Guard, what would be in the National Guard during the period, and uh, the role they played not only in World War II, but in the era preceding that, 1937 flood, the evacuations, things like that. So he's expressed an interest in the WPA records as well. Moving on to the Writers Project, and here we get a bit more diverse and more colorful. Uh, not everything the WPA did was related to construction. Obviously, everybody was affected by uh, the Great Depression, but the greatest, or one of the greatest occupations uh, affected was that of writers. So the WPA created special projects for people who had experience with newspapers, authors, uh, publishers, folks of that nature. And most of this information does not end up being published, but some of the projects do. So I want to go ahead and hit a few of those for you and explain how they can be valuable as well. The Military History of Kentucky, published around this time, is one example. It's going to give us information on uh, the role of the militia, the National Guard, and the role of Kentuckians in federal service back to pre-statehood time. So a pretty detailed publication. The Kentucky uh, Guide to the Bluegrass State was part of a project in which all 50 states, well, I guess 48 states at the time, were supposed to have a published volume of interesting landmarks in the state, things you could do, almost like a travel guide. And this does get published. It's over 300 pages, I think. It's hardback. And while it is a little dated, it's extremely fascinating the kind of information that it holds. We get geography. We even get driving tours, which you'll see an example of later. So various routes you can take through the state. Fairs and Fairmakers of Kentucky is a publication that we see sometimes uh, in use by our customers because Kentucky is a big agricultural state. For example, Kentucky is the largest beef producing state in the south. We have a long history of agriculture and the Kentucky Proud logo that the state government has introduced has created a more obvious presence uh, of Kentucky farmers. So we get questions like, what was the first uh, breed of cattle brought into Kentucky? Or when do we first see uh, fairs at the county level and the state level that promote agriculture? Well, most of those are not government created, so their origins are not readily recorded in our collection. This publication is going to give you background on that. So if you live in a county that has a large farming population or is rural, this is certainly worth having a look at. 
some examples from inside. I didn't want to just give you the covers. We see an example here from uh, the military history of Kentucky that I mentioned earlier. This, uh, I tried to pull out examples within this presentation that have been relevant to other researchers. I didn't just want to pull something out of the air, but I wanted to pull something that I really thought would be helpful. And we recently had uh, a person contact us from St. Mary's City in Ohio, and they were questioning the number of Kentucky militia who had served there in the 1790s uh, in defending the frontier. And we don't have a lot of information on that, but one of the publications we do have pertaining to that is the description contained in this volume. So, valuable information there. If you all can read that, this is a, a unique picture from the Fair and Fair Makers. You can go to the federal census on Ancestry.com or some of these other programs and get the population of the United States or of Kentucky uh, for 1840 through 1940, no problem. What you probably will not see is the number of horses, cattle, mule, hogs in the state. You can see just beneath that uh, bit of statistical information, the actual number of farms in the state in 1850, mm -hmm. 74,777. The kind of information contained in here is extremely valuable for anybody who's doing a history of the state or just a history of agriculture. So again, very valuable information. <clears throat> and finally, I promised you a driving tour. So here is one example of the kinds of things you could look to see in Covington if you're driving through there. This is again from the Kentucky Guide you're going to get information on the radio stations, the cost of a taxi, the airport, the bus station, the railroad station. All this kind of information uh, is used by our researchers in the research room. We had a gentleman who recently published a book on railroads in the state, anybody doing um, urban archaeology, which is a growing field. People want to investigate old buildings, their purpose, what they were built for. This kind of information is going to provide you details you're not going to find anywhere else. The Sanborn insurance maps people use often. I don't know how many local libraries have those, but provide you some information within the county seat. But as far as I know, this is one of the only publications that's going to provide information on a broader basis about the structures that are being used during this period. And I was curious about the egg fight, too. I, I couldn't find a picture of that, but I'd really like to see it. Now, the one downside to this collection, if it has a downside, is that it's varied in the kinds of things submitted. The WPA relied heavily on the people working in the counties to submit information, and we're at their mercy. Sometimes they're more thorough than others. So just as an example, though, uh, if you're doing research on Bourbon County, you're going to see some newspaper clippings. Again, not every county has these, but again, back to the urban archaeology, back to the building of uh, local histories. We see not just public buildings, like a library, which you might find in other documents, but businesses. From the local cleaners, complete with their address, the first newspaper or question we receive a lot for people who are doing county history or genealogy. What was the first newspaper in my county? Difficult for us to answer because they're not a government document. J.C. Penney's in Paris. Photographers. All kinds of information. So again, a very valuable collection. Yes. Have a question. Oh, I have a question. From Gail. Ah, the collection is searchable the by county for the most part, all the way back to the. Uh, and I appreciate you asking that. All the way back to the collection of uh, building project information, the project submitted, all the way up to the local and county history information. The majority of this is going to be divided by county. After that, it is not indexed in any way. It's divided by the type of record. So, for example, the writer's uh, project is separate from the construction projects. So, you would have to visit the archives in order to pull the files and glance through them that way. Is it searchable online? There's not an online. So, there's, there? there's not an online search for most of the collection. The only exception to that being. Um, there are some aerial photos, which are very, a very minute part of the collection and a, a bit grainy, so they're not the best. But also our photo collection, which involves eight boxes of the 130 that we have, uh, are online through the e-archives at KDLA. And they're a great collection. Uh, and Lisa Thompson is our photo archivist, and you're welcome to email me with any questions. I'll have my contact information up later, and I can bounce those on to her, and we're going to discuss those some in a minute. But... Uh, outside of those, unfortunately, uh, 
It's all divided by county. Thank so, you. A bit of a treasure hunt, but good stuff. <laughs> well, in addition to the statistical or the newspaper clippings that we find in the writer's project, there's also a collection of narratives where individuals were sent out within the county. And they collected whatever they could about culture, about local history, and about the people and brought that back. Oh, another question. Mm -hmm. Does the Library of Congress have... I do not believe so. Um, let me jot that down. Not to my knowledge. But I will write that down and double check on that, Marina. Let me see what I can come up with. It would be handy if they did, though. Mm -hmm. But So as I said, much of the information you're going to see in these files, and, and by the way, I appreciate the question, so don't hesitate to ask them, and like I say, Alicia can flag me down because I get on a roll. And sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it's not. So <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, the bulk of this collection, as I said, is unpublished. Uh, and is valuable when people are doing not only local histories, but on a more international scale. Just a quick overview of what we see on the screen here, and then I'll tell you how that can be valuable. Again, people were sent out basically to write down what they heard, what they saw, what they experienced. And this comes in every way, shape, and form. We do get narratives, which I'm going to discuss more in a minute, but we also get folklore, superstitions, even jokes you can see in the top left corner. If anybody ever asks you how long has the, the joke about the chicken crossing the road been around, well, it's been around at least since the 30s because it shows up in this collection. <laughs> On the right, you see a more serious story under folklore about the engineer's child. A uh, bit of a song about uh, an engineer who has to go to work on a train. He has a child sick at home, and he asks his wife to put a signal, a various color lamp out, so he could see where the child was improving or not. So a neat collection. When you look at it, it seems entertaining, but it might seem like a hodgepodge, that there's not a lot of relevance to it. We've had it used a few times uh, recently, but the most fascinating use of this kind of information that I've seen is we had a researcher uh, from Africa who visited the research room and pulled these records. And just out of curiosity, you have to find out what Central Kentucky in 1930 has to do with Africa. But his research was centered around African American folklore. And he was curious to know what beliefs, what practices, what rituals, what superstitions had translated through slavery and then survived uh, the antebellum period in various forms in eastern Kentucky. And he was reading through these and jotting down beliefs that were similar to those he'd encountered in Africa. So that was a unique twist that we hadn't seen before. And I'll show you more examples of that in a moment. I included this just because I personally was amazed. So you'll forgive me for the short digression. Uh, we grew up with this song on top of Old Smokey. I did not realize that there is a alternate version in which somebody had lost the person they love and they're talking about that but again the kinds of songs and uh, cultural practices we see in this collection are just extremely valuable for anybody researching um, Kentucky from one end to the other All right. you can call us if you have something extremely specific most of our, uh, where our staff is so small and the volume uh, of our collection is so large, if it's something that's indexed or something we could search through easily, uh, our staff can do that. So, for example, if it was a construction project that you're looking for, want to know when a, a building was built or if it was built with the WPA, we know what county it's in, we could pull that file and go through that. If it was something more extemporaneous like uh, looking for examples of uh, ballads or songs from a specific county, that would be more difficult for us to do. So there are some instances. If you have any questions, you're certainly welcome to email me, and I can tell you how feasible it is. And if it's something we can do, we will. Uh, in many cases, like I say, unfortunately, we can't. I wish we could. And hopefully at some point, this collection will be indexed where we can. All right, moving on more to cultural items. Again, the great value in this collection, I think, is if you pull a history book on the United States or on Kentucky during this period, you tend to see um, things on a macro scale. We want to know how many people are unemployed during the Great Depression. We want to know uh, how many people served in the military during World War II. And all that information is valuable. 
the downside to it is that much of it uh, overlooks local individuals, small uh, personalized entities, and that's what this collection does. It fills in the gaps. So you can see here an example of Christmas dinner in the Gold House in 1856. I included this because we had a professor from Yale contact us last year, and he was doing research on food history, which I didn't realize uh, was a thing, but is a growing branch in history because it speaks to culture and uh, social history. And he was looking for menus from the 19th century. Again, menus not being a government document, not the kind of thing we usually have. You might see a few in other places, but pretty thin on the ground overall. This collection, as far as I know, is only one of, I think, three locations in our collection that actually has recipes. So this uh, shows you what you could get for Christmas dinner in 1880. So pretty impressive layout. Virginia baked ham, turkey with cranberry sauce. So not a bad deal. And another example I wanted to include, shape notes. Uh, I don't know if anybody is familiar with these, but this was a music notation system that was very popular in the southeastern part of the United States. So southern historians, reference librarians, take note. Uh, the system theoretically has its origin in England, but becomes very popular in the south and survives through this period. Uh, we see a description of the kinds of notes that you used in this system here. And it's fairly alien to most of us because it's not used anymore. The image at the bottom, I will add the disclaimer, is not from the WPA collection, but I wanted to show you what these look like. My grandmother actually had a songbook with this in it, and this is the only other place I've seen this collection described. So anybody who is trying to do local history, uh, this is extremely valuable because it was widespread, not only throughout the state, but as I say, throughout the southeast region of the United States. All right, a few superstitions we see as we're looking through here. Some of these you'll be familiar with. Yeah. Some of them do have a basis and scientific fact. Others, obviously, are cultural. So we see number seven and eight there about the clouds is a well-known um, way to tell the weather. Some of these I'm not familiar with. Two clocks ticking the same room is bad luck. Uh, you know, that that's kind of unique. But again, the kind of information we see and the kind of information useful to people who are tracking culture or uh, who are looking for county histories. All right. Well, the America Eats Project, I mentioned earlier, one of the favorite collections of our staff. Again, the purpose of the Writers Project is to gain knowledge on local practices in each state with the end game supposed to be this publication that came out. This includes everything, not only from landmarks and culture, but also recipes. So in this collection, you're going to see some of the few recipes we have here in the archives. Um, not only do we see biscuits, pretty traditional southern fare, but we also see more intricate recipes. And I had to post this. I live in Lawrenceburg, Anderson County, and I was fearful they would not allow me to return home if I didn't post their recipe for burgoo. <laughs> so the gentleman on the uh, right side of the screen is J.T. Looney. He was kind of the Colonel Sanders of Kentucky food before KFC was famous. And uh, for anybody who doesn't know, burgoo is a kind of stew. But this is just an example of the local flavor, forgive the pun, that we see in these records. So you could actually take this record and make your own bot of uh, J.T. Looney certified burgoo. I will point out, if you look at the recipe, that he never believed it should be made in small quantities. So as long as you have 800 pounds of wild game, 200 pounds of fowl, 168 gallons of tomatoes, 36 gallons of corn, and uh, plenty of puri and carrots, you can probably pull it off. Otherwise, you might want to hold off. But again, cultural items that we would expect to see. I think there's a recipe in here for derby pie, various kinds of foods like that that we identify with local culture. Another question come up? Yeah, from Dale. Mm -hmm. Okay. No, uh, no uh, arrangements need to be made ahead of time. When you come in, you'll enter the research room, and we have the finding aid, our transmittal, for where these boxes are. And we flip through it, find the counties you want, fill out the request form, and within 15 minutes, we have the boxes for you. So uh, anybody who wants to stop in, I highly recommend it. Uh, 
it's definitely an interesting collection and oftentimes might point you to other things in our collection that you wouldn't have thought about. So again, it's a neat filler for anybody doing local, county, geological, social history, any kind of research. Yes, and we're open from 9 to 4. Any other questions so far? Or I didn't miss anybody, did I? Mm -hmm. All right, you guys have to let me know. Again, in the Writers Project, back to the narratives that we see, people were hired to chronicle county history. Now, a lot of the information you're going to see in this is what you could find with a 10-second search in Google. For example, Powell County was established in 1852 out of parts of Montgomery, Clark, and Estill. That's very true. Not difficult to find. It mentions the Act of the General Assembly down there about midway is on the page that tells you uh, how the county was organized, the various boundaries. But what you're not going to find in most publications is this kind of information. The first hotel in Stanton, county seat of Powell County in 1852, its owner and the price uh, of all the services they offered. So for only 10 cents, you could stay in the first hotel in, in Powell County. The horse, for some reason, was 50 cents. I'm not sure if they got better care or I don't know what, what the deal was with that. But again, this is the information you're not going to see in the county history for the most part. The only other place you might find this is in the county clerk order book, which is a public record uh, that we hold here, but fairly far and in between. So great for county histories, which are a growing list of publications that we have here in the state. Copies of the original records, that's a very good question. Copies of original records here are uh, a quarter apiece. If it's on microfilm, it's 50 cents. But if you have a digital camera, we encourage you to bring those. Most of these, as you can see from the image on the screen, are pretty clear, pretty legible. So digital photos are certainly uh, encouraged, and uh, obviously those are free. And so <laughs> that's no problem at all. All right. And I thought this was going to be a little bit bigger when I put it together. So again, I do hope everything is legible on your screen. If it's not, I apologize. If you want copies of any of the images uh, a little closer or a little more zoomed in, I can certainly send those to you as well. Like I say, my contact information uh, will be at the end of the presentation here. I wanted to give you a, another example of the kinds of county history that we see listed in this collection. The origin of uh, the courthouse in Washington County I thought was a great example. If you travel to Springfield, you will see the courthouse there on the corner of Main and Cross Streets, and it's as erected 1816. And I don't know if this claim is still made or not, but for a long time it was the oldest still in use courthouse west of the Allegheny Mountains. So that's kind of the local community's claim to fame. But reading these records, you can see that it's actually the third courthouse the county has. So, and I apologize, like I say, it's not as clear as I hoped that it would be for you. But the county was formed in 1792. The first courthouse was built in 1794. So, for well over a year, the county clerk has to hold county official or county court and records somewhere. Where does he do that? Well, according to this narrative, they went from house to house. So you donated, I suppose, your living room or your parlor to the county, and they used that to conduct business such as recording deeds and marriages. Oh. We even get the names of a few of the individuals who participated in this. So Hugh McElroy at the top of the second page there is mentioned as one gentleman where the county court sat. Uh, we see that they finally get the courthouse built, and unfortunately, like so many of Kentucky's older wooden structures, especially those filled with really dry paper, it burns down. But the second courthouse is built of brick, erected in uh, also in 97, and suffers the same fate in 1814. Mm -hmm. So the current courthouse uh, there in Springfield, and again, I'm pretty sure it's still in use, but it's still standing for sure, was built in 1816. It was the third structure. We see not only the date it was built, but the amount of money it cost to build it, the name of the mason uh, worker who built it, so a lot of valuable information on local history there. Now, these images are in paper, and I will admit, even when you see this particular image in person, this person wrote with light pencil, so I apologize for that. But I wanted to go ahead and show you a bit more information. This is actually from a survey of county records, which we're going to go over more in a minute. But because it pertained to the same subject, I wanted to include it here. This more, provides more details on the courthouse. 
We see here, though, as we mentioned, it wasn't built for quite a while after statehood was declared, or excuse me, after the county was created. And so we know the county court moved from house to house, but what about the circuit court? What about the court that actually tries people? Um, or would have been what's called the court of quarter sessions at this time. If you were arrested for something, where did you go? Well, apparently you didn't go to the same house as where the county court was. I guess that would have been kind of crowded. That actually moved around also. And we see on the fourth line here at the end, Francis Simbrel, a local resident, uh, was one of the locations where a circuit court was held. So not only do we have the origin of the various courthouses in the county, but we also have where court was held, who participated, and again, a wealth of information that is simply not going to survive anywhere else. What I said about the images earlier, ditto on this, I apologize. <laughs> but the question here was, were surveys recorded anywhere else? The public, or the purpose of the county inventories was to find out what records survive in what places. Obviously in the 20th century there are processes for the retention of records of historic genealogical value, but not the case in the 1800s. So many of these records have sat in courthouses. People don't know what survives. The state archives does not exist at this point. There's not a staff monitoring uh, the keeping of records, so a shameless plug there for the archives. Uh, <laughs> So one of the purposes of the WPA workers in the counties was to go to local repositories and see what survives. This questionnaire was over 40 questions long, and they're asking extremely detailed bits of information, such as if there's no plat book in the county, where were plats recorded? Were they recorded at all? This is a question if you've ever had a genealogy patron that comes up a lot except for the very western por portion of the state, west of the Tennessee River, Kentucky has never operated on a township system. So we don't get nice, neat mm -hmm. layouts of property lines early in the state's history. <clears throat> we get descriptions like, you go down to the oak tree, over to the twin birches, to the old stone fence, and then past Farmer John's property line, and that's the outline of your property. That's not helpful today. Plats are an extremely valuable piece of information. And the question here was, if there are no plat books, where are these kept? The respondent went to the courthouse, went through the records, did a survey, and said there are actually 19 plats from the 1790s, or the early part of Washington County's history, kept in uh, other records. So deed books are usually the local culprit, but a processioner's book was where Washington County's early plats were kept. Again, is this everybody in the county? No, unfortunately not. But it's bits and pieces of information that are very valuable to local historians and to genealogists who are trying to trace where ancestors were. All right. I am going to blow this one up in a minute, but this is an example of the kind of form filled out in addition to the narrative information provided. Uh, they were given forms on recording what survives in various locations. Let me blow this up a little bit. The subject being discussed here are wills in the county. Now, most counties still have their will books. Usually when you file a will, and this is primarily helpful with genealogy, but also with local historians, uh, usually when you file a will, you have your paper copy, but it also goes in the county court will book. We have copies of most of those here at the archives. Usually the counties will have a copy or they'll retain the originals in many cases unless there's been a fire or flood, something like that. So this doesn't seem like a big deal. What was interesting here and what will be most useful for your patrons is I was glancing at it and I started to pass it over and I did a double take. Number three there under quantity, 264 file boxes of wills in the 1930s. And I got a hold of a co-worker who travels to the various counties and uh, tries to assist county officials in whatever way he can. And I said, you know, in Washington County, this says there are over 200 boxes of wills. My understanding is, from our indexing, is that we have the will books, but not loose documents. Is it possible that any of this still survives? And his answer was, yes. While we are working to film and organize and preserve documents as quickly as we can, Obviously, our staff is limited. Obviously, the county staff is limited. So the courthouses often have considerable numbers of boxes of records that have not been processed. 
Does all of this survive? Well, over 70 years, it's probably doubtful. But it does at least provide a clue, and it certainly saves people from traveling to 10 different courthouses through the length of their research. Okay. It would depend on what he did. That's a good question. If you're looking for an individual who worked for the WPA, the downside to this is while we get lots of information about the projects, unless he was a, uh, an interviewer for the writer's project or unless he was an administrative official who might be submitting correspondence, his name probably isn't going to be mentioned. And we saw from those original files where they were working on leveling the roads and uh, creating drainage ditches and stuff, how much detail they go in about the materials needed, about the time it would take, about the location of the project, but unfortunately, they are not as detailed about the men uh, who worked on it, which is a bummer because I know I had uh, grandparents who were in some of the New Deal programs as well, and uh, I wish they had been as detailed as they were. I wish they had been a little more detailed. Would it, would it include grazing? It could if they were worked on uh, by the WPA, and again, they worked on a number of projects from state parks to county roads, so you know it's certainly worth looking into. Um, there are a lot of programs and projects going on at this time. For example, the Civilian Conservation Corps is around the same time. They're also doing uh, a lot of land development, providing a lot of local services. So the tricky part there is knowing which program participated in the renovation or the building of the project you're looking for. There is a list of projects. Uh, they're on microfilm in the research room. They are divided by county, uh, and there's quite a few applications submitted. So yeah, certainly so. And there are files. That's a good question too. There are files from all 120 counties. They are more voluminous for some counties than others, and not always in the way that you would expect. For example, you might think that the larger counties. Uh, would have more information simply because of population or because they have a larger number of streets. That's not always the case. People are submitting the information that they think uh, or the projects they think are the most valuable. And sometimes you just had uh, a worker in a county who was more diligent and more detailed. So it, it's really difficult to know which county is going to have most information without viewing the records themselves. Great questions. All right, Alicia, when, when more pop up, let me know. Here we go. The files that are on microfilm are available for purchase. Um, like I said, there's about 80 rolls of those. So if you're interested in only a specific county, we can go through and find out if that's contained on one or two rolls for you if you're interested in purchasing it. And going to get if you're interested in purchasing the whole collection, that's fine as well. They are on 35 millimeter film. So that is $25 a roll to purchase a copy. The collection actually has, um, out of the 310 boxes, only eight are primarily dedicated to photographs. Um, they are organized by topic, and again, those are on the e-archives, so you could certainly contact Lisa Thompson, our photo archivist, to get um, a higher resolution scan. But they're, they should be keyword searchable in the e-archives, and we're going to get to those in a minute. They're going to include everything from industry uh, to architecture. So the photo collection, and it, if you see us on social media, any at all, a lot of the photos we use come from that collection. <coughs> All right. with, the, with the microfilm, who would they contact? You're welcome to contact me if you want to place an order with the microfilm. Like I say, I'll have my contact information up here in a minute, and I can take your order. We can figure out what roles and go from there. We're always happy to do that. All right. Now, as I mentioned, a small digression yet again, just to show you the variety in the kinds of records we find here. The... Folks into the courthouse were supposed to inventory what they find there, the kinds of records. Well, I don't know if somebody found this in the courthouse or if they just created it themselves. But it's a, sh a shining example of how hmm, diverse, I guess is the correct word, <laughs> these records can be. This is a layout of the Washington County Courthouse in the 1930s. And the thing I found interesting about this, if you look at number six on the map there, that's the witness chair. Anything interesting about that? You're not to the judge's left. Uh, that's where the sheriff sits. You are a few feet from the jury facing them head on on a raised platform while the judge 
can pepper you with questions over your shoulder. So this is a very hardcore setup. So for anyone who grew up with Perry Mason, apparently he was not from Kentucky because he would have had the layout wrong. <laughs> so, again, I have never seen this anywhere else. I don't know where you would find it. This kind of information, especially for writers, um, local authors, again, I mentioned historians and genealogists a lot, but any of your patrons who have an interest in that kind of information, these are definitely worth going through. All right. More on the local records. Not everything that was inventoried in the collection was a government record. They went in and any kind of piece of paper they found, they noted it for the most part. So we see that here. This is actually a description of a letter that had been found in the courthouse. I guess it had been tucked away there. It was not certainly not something that was supposed to be there. But it was a letter from 1828 discussing uh, the election of Henry Clay uh, to Congress. And uh, you, know, you think of Henry Clay as the quintessential Kentuckian. Well, not everybody thought so. And so this is actually a letter soliciting uh, the recipient to campaign against Clay. Again, you see down under number 11 here, or excuse me, under number 10 on the form, uh, the condition of the letter at the time this was written in 1936 was poor brittle, pages torn. I think if you read in there somewhere it says it was framed, um, but does it survive? Possibly, although it is doubtful. However, anybody who's done historical research can tell you sometimes you don't have the primary source, sometimes you only have a source mentioning the source. So early Kentucky politicians uh, or political historians, this is valuable information. That's a good, you're talking about, is it, yeah, that's a good question. We're talking about the floor plan. Does the PVA have that? The WPA, or, or, yeah, I'm mixing my, Acronyms. The PVA uh, does have some plats. The PVA office was created in the 1970s, so oftentimes the information they have will not date back, in my experience, as far as some of our researchers need. If you're looking for a plat from within the last 50 years, absolutely. And some counties are much more thorough than that, and you will see older plats in the PVA. But uh, in many scenarios, the plat books remain with the county clerks if they exist at all. So yeah, definitely check the, the PVA or the Property Valuation Administrator in the county if you're looking for research on plats. Always start with them, uh, but failing that, check with the county clerk for the existence of a plat book, and then we after that we move on to Plan B, which are these kinds of records. So yeah, very good question. All right, I was surprised to see this. The WPA, being a federal program, did not limit itself to county and state offices like courthouses. They went to any invent or any um, manuscript repository in the state. That includes federal entities like Fort Knox. I cannot imagine someone doing this today, walking into Fort Knox and asking to see their records. But I wanted to show you an example of the kind of federal repositories that are included in this. So we see here under number 10, what would probably be most interesting to researchers were the maps. Um, of the base. And again, if these survive, if they're even open record now is a very good question. But a very, very neat collection. All right. I'm going to stop talking about collections at this point and shift just for the last few slides here. And I'll try to rush through these so I don't take too much time uh, on uh, a subject base form. This is from the Writers Project. I wanted to show you not just what we had but how these can be useful. And again, I know I've mentioned social history a lot, but I wanted to show you an example of one of the narratives that I was talking about. This is actually a narrative of someone taken from Harlan County, and this tells the story of a gentleman named Joe Saylor. And the, when the gentleman interviews him, he's discussing his current employment situation. Again, we can get unemployment statistics on a regular basis uh, from the touch of a mouse or from typing something into Google. But this is a personal story of an individual. He was laid off from his job, and he's discussing his opinion of some of the programs that are being instituted at this time, like unemployment insurance. He's discussing his opinion of working in the mines, 
discussing his opinion of uh, various labor groups and unions. So this is not the information you're going to find anywhere except for an oral history. And again, someone who is old enough to be in the workforce at that time, oral histories of that period are pretty rare. I also wanted to show you this as an example. Uh, oftentimes this collection, because it is word of mouth being written down, is collecting information on the people that history has ignored. For example, you see here on the second line, Captain William Phillips from Uniontown was a soldier uh, in the Confederacy. That would not be hard to locate that information. We have here in the archives a research room the Adjutant General's report listing Union and Confederate soldiers. We also have Union service records. So if you wanted to find something on Captain Phillips, that would not be a problem. However, on the first line, we get Captain Phillips' wife. This document details the role she played in the war. Uh, women, obviously, and other non-combatants do not get listed in the official records. So the information recorded here is extremely valuable. She traveled with her husband's unit. Uh, she made contributions to the wounded in whatever way she could. That kind of information is what we're going to see in this collection. Also, looking at these documents, uh, we get a lot of African-American history. We see most people know, or again, a, a simple Google search will tell you that Oliver Lewis wrote Aristides in seven, 1875, first one of the Kentucky Derby. But we also get the names of other horses who participated in the Derby. Everybody remembers the winner. Can anybody name any of the other horses that ran in the first Kentucky Derby? I certainly can't. We get not only mentions of them, we get mentions of uh, a few of the riders, a few of the jockeys. We get descriptions of the horses. So again, the kind of information that you simply are not going to find in other places. This is not a large part of the collection, but there are several of these, and they're extremely valuable for historians. This is a slave narrative. Obviously, if you're being interviewed in the uh, 1930s, you're in your 80s or early 90s by the point that you're recounting this. But for example, Margaret Coleman tells the story of her emancipation. She remembers being freed. She was a very young girl at the time, but she remembers the soldiers coming to town. She remembers uh, the name of her owner and the road that he lived on. That kind of information is extremely valuable for genealogists because you simply do not get the names of slaves before emancipation. So again, there are not a bunch of these. It's not something that somebody would probably come and have a chance of finding their specific ancestor. But if you're wanting to know the life story of the folks that are not often mentioned in the history books, this collection will give you a glimpse of that. I want to show you this photo. This is in, uh, again, the photo collection that we mentioned. Um, this is Jack Tracy of Paris, Kentucky who was a slave as a young man and actually thinks that he could remember where the chains um, that uh, the plantation had used were buried. So again, valuable for African American historians, not the kind of information you're going to see in a lot of other places. Well, in addition to county histories, and I see I've got just a few minutes, so I will rush through this really quickly. We also get religious history. Uh, in these inventories, churches were inventoried as well. The most valuable bits of information, usually for historians or genealogists, we see here are the kinds of records they retained. Uh, you see the minute books listed there under number nine. Primarily baptism and christening records are what people want the most. We do not house those here because they are not government records, and in many cases they do not survive. But Kentucky doesn't get a birth and death law until 1852. That makes it about 10 years. The legislature repeals it. They can't get people to participate. They try again in 1874. The same thing happens five years later. So we don't get our current birth and death law until 1911. If you're looking for the parents of an individual born in the 1860s or in the 1880s, the 1890s, sometimes up through 1910, depending on the county, you will have trouble locating that. So what we recommend to people is if you know the local church, or parish, or diocese, this kind of information is valuable. Sometimes you will just get a small card like this giving you information about the church, the name of the pastor, religious affiliation, or they were associated with an address. But oftentimes you get more detailed information down to the minutes. Uh, we see the members of the congregation who participated in these meetings. Again, we get lots of questions for people who are trying to find deeds to write local histories of their congregation. There's a wealth of these records that survive. And again, uh, African American researchers will find this uh, collection extremely valuable because we get descriptions of the building. We get names of ministers. We get the kinds of information 
that we don't see anywhere else. And this is not only true of churches, but we see here anyone in Lexington knows um, one of the largest Jewish congregations is the Adith, um, temp Adith Israel Temple, or excuse me, Tabernacle. So this congregation here is described. We don't see a lot of information, and again, I apologize that it fragmented some, uh, on the records kept, but we do get descriptions of the building. We get when the building was built, the original address, who the founding rabbi was. And occasionally you will see attached information. So this is a different uh, Jewish community in Lexington as well. But we get from them not only the name of the founding rabbi there under number eight, but we get where he was from. He actually traveled from Russia through Berlin before he came to the United States. So religious historians, people just wanting to know about their local community, uh, this is good stuff. Ending with our photo collection, since I only have four minutes, uh, we're going to see as I said, a variety of topics covered here. This is the big singing, which took place in Benton, Kentucky. It was primarily, primarily religious music, but people gathered uh, in the hundreds to sing. And so, again, a neat picture of uh, culture during the period. We're going to cover industry as well. I don't know if anybody recognizes the handsome individual there on the right, but if you don't, being Derby Week, I will go ahead and tell you that is Man of War. Because, you know, not that we have any history with horses in Kentucky. Nobody would need that information. So, again, we also get pictures of events such as the Derby, extremely valuable. I will say I always feel bad when I see this picture for the one gentleman on the right who's standing up above the crowd. Everybody else is looking at the crowd of horses. You have to wonder how far behind his horse truly is in that image because he is certainly not looking at the bunch there. But, again, events are covered. Industry, steel workers are covered. And again, there may only be a single manila folder with 10 to 15 images uh, of a specific subject, such as manufacturing or industry. But we get a wide collection, or a wide variety here, from Mule Day in the top left corner, sheep, cattle, the blessing of the hounds from the local Iroquois Hunt Club. Mm. Uh, I don't. It, Shaker Village still does something like this every year. There's no hunt, but they still have the blessing of the hounds. So again, a great collection. Winding up here, of course, military subjects are included. Uh, this unit was unidentified, but it's probably the 123rd Cavalry, which was based in Kentucky. It was taken in 1940, and the horse cavalry is abolished from the U.S. military in 1941. So this is probably one of the last photos you will see anywhere in the United States of cavalry on maneuvers. And finally, the pack horse librarians. We couldn't go without mentioning them. I'm sure everybody knows this group, but for anybody who doesn't, one of the projects in eastern Kentucky was to supply people with reading material. The Pack Horse Librarians did that, traveling sometimes 30 and 50 miles a day, or excuse me, 50 to 80 miles a day from their county seat to members of the community. Uh, records were all stored in the county seat, and they took out over the roads, and sometimes where there were no roads. So the WPA only paid their salaries, did not pay for materials, so a lot of these were used and uh, had to be... Um, donated, but the recipients were always grateful, and you will see uh, the description of that or in photos of that described here. So, not an easy feat, and our hat is certainly off to those people. All right, with 60 seconds left, this is my contact information. If you have any questions, you're welcome to email me, and if I do not know the answer, I will find someone who does. I also encourage you to follow us. Uh, I'm sure many of you are already following the State Library. I encourage you also to follow the State Archives so you can learn about more of our collections on Tumblr, Twitter, or Facebook. So, Any other questions for the last 60 seconds I'm happy to take, or if you would much rather email me, you are certainly welcome to do that, too. Micah, one, I'm trying to get more information from Kathy. There's an index for possibly finding a certain horse. There is a list of, not an index, but a list of participants in the Derby, not just the winners, but participants. Uh, was the horse in the Derby, or was it just a, a well-known horse who participated in other races? Okay. Yeah, that might be that might be something possible. Um, if you want to shoot me an email with the name of the horse, uh, feel free to do that. Let me see what I can find, and uh, hopefully we'll have some luck with that.
Oh, my pleasure. Thank you all for participating and again suffering through my springtime allergies. <laughs> Yes, feel free. Feel free to send me an email.